Last Monday night, as part of the Shakespeare retold season, BBC One television screened Peter Moffat's modern adaptation of Shakespeare's Macbeth. This evening, on Drama on Three, we present Shakespeare's play in his own language. The play is introduced by Sir Richard Eyre. Macbeth is Shakespeare's shortest, quickest tragedy. Its colours are black and red. The play summons up dusk and midnight, and at the end, a poor player who struts and frets with empty sound and fury, his life a candle that is snuffed out, signifying nothing. Along the way, we witness high passion, faulting ambition, alliances made and broken. Macbeth is a soldier. He's great in action, but not in judgment. Give him a sword, and without hesitation he will unseam a traitor from the knave to the chops. But give him words, and he'll first be easily led, then hesitant. His wife chides him for this. But ironically, as the two of them wade deeper into blood, he becomes more purposeful, she becomes a nightmare-beset shadow of her former self. Shakespeare doesn't usually portray married couples who work together as partners. There are moments of exceptional tenderness between the Macbeths, yet there's an emptiness at the core of their relationship. The play is scarred by images of sterility and harrowed by glimpses of dead babies. Is power, in the end, a substitute for love? Is ambition nothing but compensation for the sorrow of childlessness? Macbeth by William Shakespeare With Ken Stott as Macbeth and Phyllis Logan as Lady Macbeth Lost and won. That will be ear the set of sun. Where the place? Here to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grey Morgan. What a call! Anon! Fair is found, and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filthy air. What bloody man is that? He can report a seemeth by his plight of the revolt, the new estate. This is the sergeant who, like a good and hardy soldier, fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend! Say to the king the knowledge of the broil as thou didst leave it. Doubtful it stood, as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. The merciless MacDonald, worthy to be a rebel, for to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him from the western isles. Of cairns and gallow glasses is supplied, and fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's whore. But all's too weak for brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name. Disdaining fortune with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution, like Valor's minion carved out his passage till he faced the slave. Which ne'er shook hands, nor bade farewell to him, till he unseamed him from the knave to the chaps, and fixed his head upon our battlements. Oh. Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. Mark, King of Scotland, Mark. No sooner justice had, with valour armed, compelled these skipping cares to trust their heels, but the Norwegian lord, surveying vantage, with furbished arms and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. Dismayed not this, our captains, Macbeth and Banquo. Yes. As sparrows' eagles, or the hare the lion. If I say sooth, I must report the were. As cannons overcharged with double cracks, so they doubly redouble strokes upon the foe. 
except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memorize another Golgotha, I cannot tell. But I am faint. My gashes cry for help. So well thy words become thee as thy wounds, they smack of honor both. Go! Get him, surgeons! Who comes here? Five men of brass. With a haste looks through his eyes. So should he look that seems to speak things strange. God save the king. Whence came thou, worthy thing? From Fife, great king, where the Norwayan banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Codder, began a dismal conflict, till that Bologna's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit, and to conclude, the victory fell on us! Great happiness! But now, Sweno, the Norway's king, craves composition, nor would we deign him burial of his men till he dispersed at St. Combs Inch ten thousand dollars to our general use! No more. That thane of Cawdor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go, pronounce his present death. And with his former title, greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. Okay, so I suppose the first thing that um, we'll be looking at is what impression we get of Macbeth um, in this scene. I think it's fair to say that we get an impression of him as being quite a strong and like quite physically strong, I would say, um, from the way in which he's described as a soldier. I think um, what always um, impresses me in this scene with the writing is is the verbs that Shakespeare uses. I always get this impression of a, a really exaggerated um, warrior, almost like, you know, your stereotypical hero um, with the way he, um, he smoked with bloody execution and carved out his passage, um, faced the slave. You know, I get the idea of faced head on. So for me, he's always a little bit... Um, exaggerated as if he's up on a pedestal. But I, I think think part of the exaggeration fits in with the, you know the stereotype of that he's he's conforming to this stereotype that's almost actively encouraged. In fact, he's rewarded, isn't he, for these masculine qualities of being comfortable with violence and. The reported speech from the sergeant it leans towards that bravado, doesn't it? Of you know celebrating that violence. So when he talks about the unseen. You know, and those those violent verbs that you're talking about, there's almost for me a celebration of how how successful he was in that violence. Yeah, absolutely. And he warrants the name Brave Macbeth through his behaviour on the battlefield. He is deserving of his um, his title because of his actions on the battlefield. And it's supported by other people, isn't it? Even though even the king um, uses words like valiant and worthy mm -hmm. to describe him, to really um, the to really emphasise that that idea that he is um, like like Esther was saying, put on a put on a pedestal to to show off his his skills as a warrior. I always and think I, as well. Sorry, uh, Miss no. Wallace. I always think as well with this. Um, this part of the, the the scene it reminds me of when we first meet curly's wife and we hear about her from candy and in in you know when we there we know it's because he, we want to be prejudiced but here we know that we're hearing about Macbeth before we meet him because we want that exaggerated view of him as a as a warrior that's what shakespeare wants us to have as an audience in in our minds and i think that that is more effective when it's reported by someone else rather than us seeing it in the flesh in terms of action from Macbeth because we're assured by the fact that it's given to us by people of a high status like the captain and, and the king and so forth so our impression is built through those who have status in the play 
Absolutely. I completely agree with that. I was going to I was going to say the same thing about those. The characters that are reporting on him are are high standing members of the of the army and and of the, that fighting force. And, and they're saying all these positive things and describing him in, in such a um, exaggerated way that it really, really does. From a reader's point of view, we, we really do get that impression of of him being a complete success and and somebody who who we instantly look up to and think think very positively of at this part of the play. Definitely, and there's this, uh, an element of feeling unnerved also because the unseen to him from the nave to the chops, you <laughs> kind of, as an audience, are taken back a little at his potential mm. to be so violent on the battlefield. That's how I feel anyway as an audience member. Mm. But there is definitely an, an element of, a, you know, celeb we're celebrating his success. This, Alice, I think you've hit the nail on the head with, when I, when I read the scene briefly to um, my Year 10 group, the, when they explored what the images actually meant, they were quite repulsed and shocked mm -hmm. by uh, how graphic the violence was. Mm -hmm. but I think there's a huge contrast there for how how comfortable and how accepting um, they are with this this sort of violence and how uh, a modern day audience reads it and just think, but but that's that's horrendous. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost more shocking because we're looking at it at this time apart now, because you just wouldn't consider that a human being could do that to another human being, would you? I think what always um, catches me in this as well is when it talks at, it talks about him carving out his passage till he faced the slave. Yeah. It's not the fact that he comes upon the traitor in the course of the battle, he purposely seeks out the traitor in order to bring him to justice. And I find that highly ironic because whilst he is at this point, the one deciding upon the justice, the one facing the, the traitor, um, he is the one that becomes that traitor um, at the uh, ultimately, he he becomes the person that he seeks to punish um, at this point, and I find that to be a very powerful image um, to open the play with. And also because it happens in a really short space of time, that turnabout, yeah, um, mm -hmm. after the battle, you know, it it makes me question to what extent when he is carving his passage to face the slave, is he acting like an automaton? This kind of um, conditioned soldier and warrior but then to kind of just turn about so quickly afterwards it just makes me think actually he isn't there's there's something a bit for me anyway I, it's something a bit shallow there i think that shallowness is is something that is is quite um important to to think about from events later on in in the play with him um making these these very these huge decisions for his own for his own benefit um, and, and that's showing in, in this that he's making these massive decisions for, for what, are, what is quite a blinkered, um, narrow uh, uh, tunnel vision almost approach to life. I think just, just listening to you discuss it is, is making me question you know, how much progression he makes between the beginning and the end of the play as, as a character. Because if, if I consider how different Lady Macbeth is at the end in Act 5 in comparison to where she is at the beginning um, and I look at him and he's describing these images or it's been reported about him you know of how he he was at the beginning and I think at the end he doesn't seem to me to have actually made any progress or transformation he's still at the end as self-centered and uh, you know it's all about him and it's all about his leadership and his violent acts yeah. um, Whereas, whereas Lady Macbeth is a is just a totally different person, isn't she? Yeah, I I totally agree. I and I think for me that's why that when we move on to the next, um, you know, in a few scenes time when we see her use of um, th this graphic language and you know what you were saying earlier about a modern audience being quite shocked by this violence, and then we get her her we hear her speaking like that 
But then when we bear in mind that she does transform by the end of the play, I think it really affects our our reading of the two characters. Yeah, agreed. I think coming back to that idea of, you know, just how exaggerated is this portrayal of Macbeth and to what extent is he strong if the turnabout in his allegiance comes about so quickly leads me just to think about what his strengths and weaknesses are in terms of he's very he's clearly there's no doubt that he's physically strong uh mm. you know we're told that here but to change his allegiance so quickly and to become the traitor so quickly i wonder whether his weakness lies in his mind and that there is a conflict within the character of Macbeth where his weakness of mind leads him to abuse his physical strength. I think there's definitely evidence that you can draw um, from from later on in the play that would would support that that point of view with him. Um, that that weakness of mind is that there's some very obvious. Um, elements when he when he sees ghosts and what have you that that really emphasise that that weakness with his with his character. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's a really interesting point that you've made there. And it becomes more interesting when you then start to you know if you're exploring him and his relationship with his wife. Mm. Um, you know why do they you know we, we always question don't we why they end up acting like they do but actually when you couple his weakness of mind with her um you know what i believe is her determination to please the husband that she loves mm. and those two things together put a couple together who don't really think straight and, yeah. and then that would take me back to the mm. why they, why they think changes so quickly um after this battle mm. I question to what extent Shakespeare actually is telling us, is he brave at this stage in Act 1, Scene 2, or is it um, luck of the draw? Is it fortune, as mentioned in the mm. in the text? Um, is, he, is it by having the captain tell us this, is there an element of maybe he's not as brave as perhaps we're being led to believe because we're hearing it from somebody else? And we don't know the ins and outs, but and because Shakespeare makes this reference to fortune, has he just been lucky? That's my impression. Mm, that's yeah, I think that's a really good observation. Because I think the image that is um, a comp that accompanies the idea of fortune is that fortune is fickle; that it changes sides, mm. which uh, also relates. To, to Macbeth, the character. Absolutely. It almost embodies his character, isn't it? Doesn't mm. it? With mm. his um, treatment of Duncan, his treatment of Banquo, his treatment of his wife. It embodies all those different events from later on in the in the play as well. Mm -hmm. Well, just let's have a look at actually um, the last line of the, uh, of the scene. The last line of the scene is given to Duncan and um, it's in reference to the title that Macbeth's about to receive as a result of the death of another traitor. And the line spoken by Duncan, I find to be quite interesting. What he, referring to the, to the traitor, hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. Um, and I think up to this point in the discussion, we've spoken quite a lot about opposites, juxtapositions, things coming together, strengths and weaknesses, um, bravery, fortune and, you know, things being planned. And in fact, the scene ends with this oppositional pair lost and won. Mm. And I wonder what Shakespeare is trying to set up there it's very much thinking like it is, or suggesting it's almost like a game isn't it that the the battle that they've that they've just um uh, come from was a game and and the fact that that um it, macbeth won 
as part of fortune from from luck also suggests an element of, of a, a game or a competition mm -hmm. and him seeking out um seeking to win throughout the play almost links to what what duncan's saying there with with him with with that that line at the end of the act so that that's quite interesting to look at it in that way of him being being the winner um because that's what he wants to do all the way through isn't it he wants to win so so yeah I'm just desperately going back through my scenes because I think there's a nice link with something Lady Macbeth says later on. So leave me a moment and I will come back. There's a reference to her when she, she talks about um, in Act 1, Scene 5, when she talks about um, uh, and yet would wrongly win. Mm. I don't know if that's the one that you... It's, but it. But it's that it's that power struggle that we keep talking mm -hmm. about, isn't it? It's it, I think it's the difference between doing what necessarily people maybe expect of you and want you to do, and actually what your internal monologue is telling you that you maybe should do and back off. You know, the sensible side of you. Um, uh, go on. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I found a bit that I, it wasn't that bit, although I think that does link for that reason. It's a bit in Act 3, Scene 2, later on, when she says, to safe it to be that which we destroy, then by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. And, and she's saying that before he's on, on the, she's on her own on, on the stage. Um, and, and I just think, we, I just wanted to link it back to the point we made earlier, Esther, that she goes through that transformation at the end of the play. And here we've got that inner, inner her inner thoughts of her realising that... Um, it would have been safer not to act or win this in the first place is how I read that. Um, but we don't see that from him. That's that's why I feel like it, if if you ask me a personal preference about which character, not you favour more as an audience member, but I've almost got more respect for her uh, and she feels like a less two-dimensional character because I don't really see even any effort on his part to gain any self-awareness or understanding about his role in it or what happened in it. It just feels like he goes after something and he, he decides on that track and that path. Uh, and he has no understanding or comprehension of, of what even happened. Uh, I find that very frustrating. I think it's really interesting as you've just described that, we're back to the battle again and him carving out his passive mm -hmm. on that track. And I almost feel as if, if he were to be introspective, and 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 he is, although it is too late, when she dies, he there is the there is for me a moment of introspection there, but I feel like for me there's a conflict for him between introspection and action. That if he stops and he thinks and he considers and he weighs up, then he can't act, and if he can't act, then he doesn't get that which he desires and so I think even if he has the ability to question and he has the ability to um, observe his actions it's something that he cannot afford to do if he is to get that which he's which he in the end becomes you know so the desire to have that is ultimately you know what traps him I think that's a really good point and one that I, I maybe had missed um, in my own thoughts um, because when he does think about the act of of killing Duncan he does he does he does think about that he goes through a process with that a discussion with his wife and then doubts himself about that so there, there's definitely that when he doesn't think about things when he just acts straight away he does I suppose get more done? Although whether whether he gets the right things done or not is up for debate, I suppose. I think. Sorry. I think, I think this last line for me, this idea about the lost and won, I think it sets us up for this idea that. things aren't actually that clear cut that in the play 
winning and losing isn't like it is on the battlefield. Like the literal battlefield, there's a winner and there's a loser. Um, and Macbeth shows us that as a soldier, but actually when you when it comes to desire when it comes to action when it comes to the mind when it comes to personal relationships winning the the line between winning and losing is is blurred and macbeth finds that out because whilst he wins that the crown um there's so much more that he he loses as a result of that What, as an audience member, would you be expecting of Mac if you didn't know the play? What would you be expecting um, of him at this point as the play continues? I think for me, I just lost my scene. Um, for me, the fact that he has fought so valiantly against Macdonald, the traitor for his king i would be i would expect him to carry on being you know his king's loyal servant mm. like a noble war hero i would expect mm. okay <clears throat> thanks to everyone for their input on the scene i think it's interesting to bring together so many different points of view and i think what our discussion has really proved is that there is no one overriding way to read this text and the characters and there's a multitude of opinions and ideas to be found even <clears throat> just in this opening scene. So thank you very much for everyone, to everyone for their contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.